Good morning. Uh, if we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Levi, and I serve as the campus pastor here in Greece. I'm excited to be able to bring the word to you today. Uh, we're in part 11 of our series called At the Core. We've been going through, this summer, we've been going through the series At the Core, going through our core values as a church. And you know, one of the things I love about our church, this is one of the things that I just really, really love, we are a multi-generational church. We're a multi-generational, we don't, we're not just a church for like young hipsters with the skinny jeans and all that, and we're not, we're not a church that's just for old folks with gray hair, and, and like we're, we've got young and old, and we've got everyone in between. Anyone thankful for that? That's a beautiful thing. If you're, if you're here today and you don't know whether you're young or old, just turn to the person next to you and ask them, and I'm sure they'll let you know. <laughs> it's been great this summer to hear from all of our campus pastors, and, and like I said, I'm excited to preach today. One of the things that you should know about me is um, I'm definitely not the oldest campus pastor, uh, but I am definitely the youngest. I am the youngest campus pastor, in case you didn't already guess, and I oftentimes feel like the youngest. Sometimes I feel a little bit too young. Sometimes I feel a little bit too young, but something happened to me recently uh, that made me change the way that I thought about myself. I, I went bowling. I don't know if that's ever happened to you when you go bowling. You just kind of change the way you think about yourself, but I went bowling, and when I went bowling, um, when I got there, there wasn't really anyone there. there was, like, we were the first ones there, and as people started to come in, my buddy Mark turns to me and says, Levi, I think you might be the oldest person in the bowling alley, and I looked up, and I looked around, and sure enough, he was right. I was the oldest person in the bowling alley, and any, any uh, um, insecurity that I felt from being too young, like a flip of a switch turned to an insecurity of being too old immediately, and this is what I learned that day. No matter how old or young you are, you'll always have a reason to feel insecure. You'll always have a reason to feel insecure. You'll feel too young until you feel too old. But you'll never feel just right. You'll never feel just right. And to that mindset, I've got good news for you. For the young, the old, and everyone in between. Age doesn't matter unless you are a cheese. Let's put the picture up there. Age doesn't matter unless you are a stinky cheese, right? Hear, hear me out. Our, our lives are not determined by how many minutes we've lived. But it's by the moments it's our response to the moments where God has shown up in our lives. Let me, let me say it this way. Think less about minutes. Think more about moments. Even as I preach this sermon, think less about the minutes. Think more about the moment that God is inviting you into this morning. Here's the thing. We believe, we believe that we are never too young. We are never too young to be who God created us to be, and it's never too late to become who we might have been. Both young and old generations are indispensable to the future success of the church. Or as we like to say it, and it's written right on the wall, it is never too early and it is never too late. Today, we're going to be talking about a man and, and, uh, who might have, it might be considered too late for him. We're going to talk about a man who has logged in a lot of minutes. Anyone ever heard of Abraham? We're going to be talking about Abraham today, a guy who's lived a lot of minutes, but today we're going to be talking more about some moments in his life. Less about his minutes and more about his moments. Two moments in particular, the first of which is found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. You can turn there right now, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. This is the first time we hear about Abraham, and he's 75 years old. He's 75 years old, which by most accounts would, would seem older, okay? I'm just saying older, okay? Older. This is what he says in verse 1. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God tells Abraham to go, leave your extended family, leave your hometown, this place where you've been for 75 years. Leave that place and go to this other place. Go to the land of Canaan, and if you do, I'm going to bless you. I'm going I'm to bless you. I'm going to give you some stuff. But God doesn't just choose 
Abraham to give him a whole bunch of stuff. It says, I'm blessing you so that you would be a blessing to those around you. I'm choosing you. I'm calling you out so that you would be a conduit of my goodness to the rest of the world. In other words, Abraham was called to make a difference. And church, I want to invite you into that too. You too have been called to make a difference in the world around you. No matter what season of life you find yourself in, you are called to make a difference. So let's be honest. 75 years seems pretty late to be uprooting your entire family, to go to a place hundreds of miles away, to a place you've never been, uh, a place that's inhabited by other people, by the way. It's, it's kind of late. And most people, when they get to be about 75, most people are trying to, like, wind down. And here, Abraham, he's just getting started. He's just getting started. Now, Abraham didn't just have the obstacle of his age. He also uh, had another obstacle. See, God tells Abraham that he will make him a great nation, and he'll make his name great. And what that means is that Abraham would have descendants. To become a nation, you have to have descendants. You have to have kids. And here's the problem. Abraham is 75 years old, and he has no descendants. He has no kids. The reason that they didn't have kids was not because they were using birth control. It was not the, the fact that they wanted to wait until the time was right where they got the mortgage paid off and the student loans paid off. No, they weren't worried about that back then. If you were a couple, you wanted kids. And you wanted as many kids as you could have. And to not be able to have kids was a source of deep, deep shame. Which was the case for Sarah. She was barren. She was infertile. She couldn't have kids. And you could imagine the pain and the embarrassment that that family went through. Not being able to do what your body is supposed to be able to do. Not to be able to have the family that you've always envisioned having. To deal with the awkward looks and the awkward conversations year after year. To deal with the unanswered prayers. For us to truly grasp this promise that God is giving, we, giving, we need to understand that it dealt with the very issue that caused their family the most pain. And if I were Abraham, I think this would be a good time to give God a little bit of pushback. Don't you? God, I've been here for 75 years. It's long enough to get used to a few things, right? Like, I, I know where some stuff is. I'm getting used to, like, why would I uproot my entire family to go to this foreign land where there's other people there? And, and besides, I don't even have any kids to give this land to. There's a lot at stake for Abraham to go. There's a lot of reasons for him to feel insecure, now, I don't want to oversell how old Abraham really is because ultimately he lived to be 175, okay? So that would make Abraham probably around middle-aged, which, in my opinion, doesn't take away from the value of the story. It actually makes it a little more relatable because how many of us, when we're considered to be wherever we are in between, are hesitant to start something new, to maybe go back to school, to start a family, to start reading the Bible, to start discipling people, right? How much more relatable is that? I want you to know today that it's never too late. It's never too late. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's never too late. It's never too late. Here's the crazy thing to me. Abraham is one of the most well-known people throughout history. But there was nothing worth writing about until he was 75, <laughs> You think about that. God shows up after 75 years and he tells him to go. And what was his response? He went. Verse 4, it says he went. And he didn't ask questions and he didn't put up a fight and he didn't try to talk himself out of it. He just went. And the thing that was worth writing about was not the fact that he had lived 75 years, which is a lot of minutes, by the way. It was the fact that when God showed up in the moment, he said yes. In this instance, he didn't let his age determine his obedience. So church, I ask you, are you? Are you letting the, your age be the answer that you give God? 
Are you allowing the season of your life to determine whether you say yes? Church, don't allow your minutes to determine your response in the moment. So that was moment one. Abraham Abraham had a good answer, a good response. Now we're going to go into moment two. This is 24 years later. Abraham and his family, they settle in the land of Canaan. We're in chapter 18, verse 1. You can follow along if you would like. You should know that in that 24 years since they moved, since they said yes to God, they still have not had a child. And now, instead of being 75, they're 99. So, starting in verse 1, enter in the second moment. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. By the way, sometimes God shows up when you least expect it, in the heat of the day. (laughs) He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth. I just got to say that 99 seems a little late in the game to be doing some running and some bowing. I just want to say that. Like, it just seems a little late to be doing some running and some bowing. But when God shows up, it doesn't matter. Abraham is not concerned about how old he is or how it might look for him to be running He just goes because when God shows up, it's less about the minutes on the clock and it's more about the moment. It's as if time stands still. See, here's the thing. Uh, Time, minutes, can be measured on the clock. But moments are measured by their significance. And this is a significant moment because God shows up and God is significant. And you see that demonstrated in Abraham's life, the fact that he's running and bowing and God interrupts his day and he allows God to interrupt his day. Then verse 9, it says this, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. She was eavesdropping, by the way. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. I like the way that's advanced in years. That's a good, that's a nice way to say that. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. For she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. I just want to say, these are two very different responses. Abraham's initial response to just go and listen and obey. And now in this second instance, Sarah laughs at God. And I got to say, it's not a laughter It's not like God said something funny. It's not like she was having a good time. He didn't say a good joke. No. It was a laughter of doubt. It was a laughter of disbelief. It said that the way of women had ceased with her. Which means she had already gone through menopause. So... By all natural accounts, not only was she barren, but she also went through menopause, so it was impossible for her to have kids. Now, I don't know exactly what was going through her her mind when God tells her that she's going to have a son, but you got to understand that she's listening to this through a lens, and it's a lens of a century, this literally, a century of infertility. A lifetime of shame. So you you have to understand that she's allowing her past to be the lens in which she sees the future. So when we hear that she laughs, it's not hard to imagine that the laughter that she has is only to keep herself from crying. 
And I got to say, some of you today, some of us are looking through God and his calling in your life through a lens. And I got to say, it's not the right lens. You, you might be looking back at your past mistakes, your past failures, your past of falling short, and you're using that to see God's calling in your life. And maybe you two are laughing. But I want to challenge you. God wants to give you a new lens, a clear lens. And it's by asking a simple question, the same question that God asked Sarah. Is there anything too hard for God? When you think back about your past, remember to ask the question, is there anything too hard for God? Because here's the reality, God works best in impossible situations. He works best in the impossible situations As a matter of fact, he prefers it. See, the thing that makes this story great is that the minutes were stacked against them. That's what makes this a miracle. See, it's not just a normal story of a woman having a child. No, it's a a story of a lifetime of failure, a lifetime of not being able to do this. And then all of a sudden, in the 11th hour, God comes through, and that's the miracle. So as we fast forward the story one year later... The Lord is faithful, and they have a son. And you know what they name him? They name him Isaac, which might not mean anything to anyone else, but the name Isaac means he laughs. Isn't that funny? He laughs. It's as if God is saying, you may have laughed first, but I get the last laugh. And when they see this child, they will laugh. And it's not going to be a laughter of doubt and pain and embarrassment. It's going to be a laughter of joy because God came through. God was faithful and he fulfilled the promise. And God turns her source of embarrassment and he turns it into her legacy, what she's known for. This story highlights a couple that it may have been considered too late for them. But the Bible also speaks to people who might be a little on the younger side of God's calling. The Apostle Paul writes a letter to one of his students, Timothy, uh, who's a young pastor, and and he says this in 1 Timothy 4.12. He says this, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. If you are young, if you are a young leader, if you are a young difference maker, I want you to know that it is okay. It is okay for you to be young because Paul knew what I know and what we should all know is that you can't do anything about your age anyway. You can't do anything about the minutes on the clock. But Paul knew and said to Timothy, like, people are going to not listen to you. They're going to resist your leadership because of your age. But he's like, don't let them do that because you can't do anything to control your age. But you can control some things, he says. You can control some things. You can control the way you speak to people. You can control the way you act with people. You can choose love over selfishness. You can choose faith over doubt, and you can choose purity over sin. Paul tells Timothy, you can't control those other, you can't control the the time on the clock, but you can control your conduct. You can control the way that you live your life. And, And he says this, you can bring your character in line with your calling. You can bring your character in line with your calling. Look, church, don't let the number of minutes you've lived, whether a lot or a little, keep you from obeying God and saying yes to God in the moment. I want to share a quick story with you about someone who I believe embodies this value 
more than most. And he does it imperfectly, but he does it. And that's my brother Bob Pataglia. I love you, man. It's his birthday today. He is 69 years old. <laughs> Woo! Come on, Bob. Bob has been such a blessing to this church. If you don't know Bob, um, most of you already know him, but he serves on the worship team. He's the head of our building and grounds. <laughs> He's out there pulling weeds on his hands and knees. He serves as a small group leader. And when he's not doing any of that stuff, he's helping people in the church with projects. He's building stuff. He's digging holes. He's doing yard work. He's, I mean, like the guy is just, you wind him up, he's a dynamo. He doesn't work like he's 69. He works like he's 29. And I had a, a moment with Bob earlier this week, and I asked him, I said, Bob, how are you enjoying retirement? Because <laughs> he was here like every day this week working on projects. I said, how are you enjoying retirement? retirement. He said this. He said, Levi, you know what? My cup is overflowing. God is so, so good to me. He said, you know, some people, when they retire, they want to go on vacation. They want to travel. He said, not me. He said, I can't see myself doing anything but this, serving the one who has done everything for me. Bob, I'm so thankful for you, man. Bob, we know you're not perfect, but you certainly are an example to us, and I appreciate you. I got three action points for you this morning. Uh, we'll call it WWW. There's three W's. That'd be a really easy way for you to remember this, okay? Three W's. First one is this. Don't waste. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. And I'm not talking about your past. You can't do anything about your past. What I'm talking about is now and to the rest of the days that you have, don't waste your life, whether you're, not, you're five or you're 95. You are called to make a difference just like Abraham was. You've been blessed to be a blessing. You are a conduit of God's goodness to the world around you. But I got to say, what good is a conduit that gets blocked up? Right? Bob, I know you're on building and grounds. You don't like blocked up conduits. No one likes a blocked up conduit, right? It's not good. You have been blessed to be a blessing to those around you. All the things that you have, all the gifts that you've been given, all the personality that you have was meant to be spent on others. A life that says yes to the Lord. So don't waste. Secondly, actually before we get to the second one, I got a, a quote here from John Piper. It says this, but whatever you do, find the God-centered Christ-exalting, Bible-saturated passion of your life and find your way to say it and live for it and die for it. And you will make a difference that lasts. You will not waste your life. Don't waste. Secondly, don't wait. Don't wait to do what God is calling you to do because the reality is your next breath is not guaranteed if God is calling you to it, would you trust him that he knows what he's doing? Because in my experience, God doesn't call experts. He calls people who are available. Would you be willing to go, no questions asked? Especially for young people, guys, don't wait. Don't wait. Step into God's calling no matter what season you're in. There will always be a reason to try to put it off. Wait to, you know, when you get to the next little thing. But I find that life is all about that, the, the next thing. Oh, it'll slow down next week. It'll slow down next week. It'll slow down next week. But it never really does. So don't wait. Abraham didn't wait. He didn't have to discuss it with his friends. He didn't have to overanalyze it. He just did it. Because he knew this, that delayed obedience is really just another word for disobedience. Don't wait. And lastly, don't wish. Don't wish you were someone else. Look, it's so easy for us to think that God made some mistakes when he made us. 
It's so easy. When we, we, we start comparing ourselves to other people and we don't look this way or we don't talk this way or we don't have this skill set, right, we get on the, the, the highlight feed of, of social media and we just start comparing ourselves to others, we can get so discontent with the way God made us as if he would make a mistake on you. You have made, you, maybe you've made some mistakes in your past, but God has not made any mistakes on you. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. Everything that God gave you, everything, uh, however he made you, was built to spec for a purpose. I like this quote by Bob Goff. He says, am I the right guy? I don't know, but I'm the guy being asked. And the last thing I want to do is miss an opportunity or make God mad. So I just keep saying yes. Maybe God is doing some inexplicable things in your life. Each of us gets to decide every time whether to lean in or to step back, to say yes, to ignore it, or to tell God why he has the wrong person. Look, I go back to the story of Sarah. How easy would it have been for her to wish she was someone else, to wish that her body worked the right way, to wish that she had what it takes, that she was younger, that she had more faith. But God says, no, I want to use you. I want to use you because my power is made perfect in your weakness. I want to use you because it's going to give me more glory. I want to use you. Despite your past, despite the seasons that you've lived, I want to use you. And he turns her embarrassment into a blessing. And, and I just got to say, he's doing that with us. He do, you, you guys know that some of the best ministries have come out of people's lives where they were wrecked, that they were at the bottom of the pit, that they dealt with some really, really hard things. And when God delivered them out of it, they had a story to tell. When God delivered them out of it, they had a ministry to other people who were going through the same exact thing. What if God wanted to use your embarrassment and your past to bless someone else who's already is going through it right now? What if He turned your shame into your ministry? Embrace the season that you're in, both young and old alike. Older people don't wish you were young because the reality is you got more wisdom and more patience than you did when you were young. And young people don't wish you were old because you're going to get there one day. (laughs) Embrace the season that you're in. And church, when the world is concerned about the minutes on the clock, Would we be people who are present in the moment when God speaks? Would we be willing to say yes when he asks us? I got to say, Abraham is not the best example. He was not perfect. He was not always faithful. He made some good decisions and he made some bad decisions. (laughs) And like every other hero of the faith that came before Christ, they all fell short of the perfect standard that God had set until Jesus came around. And when Jesus was commissioned to go and make a difference, to be blessed, to be a blessing, he said yes every time. And ultimately, he said yes on our behalf when he went to the cross And he endured the punishment that we should have had. And ultimately, guys, the calling of a Christian is to lay down your life for the one who laid down his life for you. So I realize this morning that some people here, you guys are Christians, and you've been getting a lot out of this sermon. And you want to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You want to draw near to him. And you don't want to let your age get in the way of that. And some of you are not Christians. You haven't really put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. And I want to encourage you and invite you into that today. 
Just like Abraham, just like everyone who went before Jesus, they were imperfect and they fell short of God's standard. They sinned. Just like every one of us, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the penalty, the, 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 the consequence for that is death. Spiritual death away from God. But thank the Lord for Jesus who came and lived the life that we couldn't and died the death that we were supposed to die. And so this morning, I want to invite you into a moment, wherever you're watching from, to take a moment to pray, to receive Jesus for the very first time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray out loud, and you can pray by yourself, quietly. And it's not the words of the prayer that saves you. There's no magical words, but it's the heart and the faith behind the words, that if you would Put your faith and your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you say, I believe that he did live a perfect life. And I do believe that he died the death that I was supposed to have. And three days later, he rose again in victory to pay the penalty for my sin. So everyone here, we're going to take some time to bow our heads and close our eyes. And I want to invite you and lead you into this prayer today. God, I'm a sinner, and I have fallen short of your perfect standard. God, I need forgiveness. Lord, please forgive me. God, I believe that you sent your son, Jesus, to pay the price for my sin by dying on the cross. And three days later, he rose again in victory. Lord, I thank you for your great love for me. And God, it is my desire to live for you from this day forward. Come and be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you did pray that prayer at any one of our locations, including our Greece campus, if you prayed that prayer, I want to celebrate with you and welcome you into the family. And we would love the opportunity to connect with you and to follow up with you, to answer any questions that you would have. And the best way that we do that is through our connection card. And if you would put your name and your contact info on the connection card, on the back of that card is a little box that just says, I want to become a Christian for the first time today. And if you check that box and you give it to a greeter, a campus pastor will be in touch with you to answer any questions you have, to celebrate with you, to pray with you, and to give you some next steps on your journey of faith. So I'm gonna invite the worship teams at all of our campuses to come forward, and I'm gonna pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your great love demonstrated on the cross for our sins. God, that you, you are the God of impossible. Lord, no matter how young or how old we are, Lord, there is a bright future ahead. God, I'm confident that our best days can be in front of us if we would learn to listen and obey. Lord, I pray that you would give us more faith as we move forward. Not to believe the failures and the mistakes of our past, but Lord, to get a new lens. A lens that believes that anything is possible with you. So God, help us to be less concerned with the minutes on the clock and more concerned with the moment that you're inviting us into. In Jesus' name, amen.